Good morning, everyone. My name is Samantha Springer. Um, I'm a conservator at the Portland Art Museum, and I'm a member at large for WAC. And thank you all for being here. Um, and I'll just be the moderator for the rest of the morning. Seth Irwin will be presenting, and Seth is a book, paper, and photo conservator who holds a master's in art conservation, specializing in paper from Queens University. Um, in 2010, he started a private practice practice, Irwin Paper Conservation. Uh, set before then, Seth, or since then, Seth has also worked on a 14-month project with 11 museums throughout Alaska and was hired as the first full-time paper conservator for the University of Hawaii Library. So he has been to the non-contiguous United States. Um, in 2016, he moved to the Boston area to devote all of his time to his private practice. And at the beginning of 2017, he worked on a three-month project with the Alaska State Museum in Juneau, uh, treating the Treaty of Session documents for the Alaska State Museum's sesquicentennial exhibit, exhibit opening this fall. Um, and this is the project that he will be talking about today. Um, so I introduce Seth. So uh, uh, just a quick correction on, on, on Sam. So the exhibit isn't opening uh, this fall. The exhibit is actually opening next week. Uh, they were installing it uh, last Friday. So I am, these images, um, some of these images are actually right hot off the press. So it's, uh, so um, uh, good morning, everyone. And thank you for the introduction, Sam. Um, so my title, my talk is titled uh, Looking Good at 150, the Treatment of the Alaska Treaty of Session Documents for the uh, Alaska Sesquicentennial. Uh, what you're looking at here is the brand new Alaska State Museum in Juneau. Uh, it is absolutely stunning. Um, the, so I'm going to, um, let's see here. So I'm going to do this, uh, my talk structured a little different um, from the typical conservation talk, uh, the reason being is that uh, while this project is, of course, a treat, you know, based on treatments uh, and treatment work, uh, the project was actually less about treatment than some of the overriding other goals that I'm going to go into in a little bit. So um, I'm going to first go through some of the background, and then I'm going to talk about the, the actual project specifically. The, so this project kind of had uh, two primary goals, uh, the secondary of which was actually the specific treatments. Uh, the first and primary goal was to, um, uh, quote unquote, break in the new paper conservation lab at the Alaska State Museum and make sure everything was actually working properly. Uh, the reason that this was so important was that the new museum, like anything you buy, actually had a warranty on it by the contractors. And the warranty was one year from the moment they, the staff were handed the keys to the building. And um, if there were any issues, uh, such as electrical or plumbing, the contractors actually had within that one year time frame to address it. And since the Alaska State Museum has no paper conservator on staff and they probably won't for many years, they didn't want years to go by and then realize that there were problems with the lab that now the museum would be responsible for fixing on their own budget. And, um, and as all of you know, you can't truly know a lab is actually built and done properly until you actually try to work in the lab and do a project. And when you reach for something and it's not in the right spot, and then you, you know if something wasn't done right. And so because of this, the museum was, uh, was actually trying um, really hard to find a project um, that we could do in the lab. And so because of this, um, uh, just by happenstance, this year happened to be the 150th anniversary of the purchase of the Alaska Territory. So Ellen, the great Ellen Carley, uh, the object conservator from the State Museum, uh, was able to act, uh, get a state grant to have the treaty documents uh, that were part of the, the library and archive holdings uh, treated in the paper lab um, for, a, for an exhibit commemorating the transfer. Uh, and the museum had planned on doing something small before this, uh, but this grant gave them an opportunity to expand on the exhibit and also show the museum, uh, what a functioning paper lab should look like since nobody had ever seen that before. But what all of us that participated in the project saw was something even more incredible. 
that while the goal of the project was actually to break in the lab, this was really an opportunity to have three completely separate entities that had largely never collaborated on anything before to all work together for a single project. And these entities were the three collecting entities for the state, the Alaska State Museum, the Alaska Historical Library, and the Alaska State Archive. And um, so before I get into the nitty gritty of the, um, I wanna give a little bit of background of how these three entities sort of came to be. Um, let me make that slide up, okay. All right, so in uh, just a little bit of historical context here, so in 17, 1793, we see the uh, first uh, Russian colony established on the island of Kodiak, which later becomes the, uh, the Russian Alaska Company. And then on August 1st, 1867, 150 years ago, uh, Russia sells the, tori the territory of Alaska to the U.S. for $7.2 million. And while President Johnson at the time approved this, this was largely the doing of Secretary of State Seward and Russian Ambassador Stokel. Um, this resulted in a mostly positive reaction at the time. Uh, Russia was afraid the U.K. might seize Alaska if war broke out and we had just come out of a costly civil war. It was also thought that having a good friendship with Russia was important. Uh, not all the reactions to the, this purchase was positive. Uh, critics of the purchase uh, called it Seward's Folly, uh, Seward's Icebox, or my, my favorite, the Polar Bear Garden. Um, in, any, in any case, Alaska was set up as a district and then, and, and then a territory. Uh, the town of New Archangel uh, was established as the capital, and then the town later was renamed to Sitka. Uh, and uh, um, I found this online. Here's a copy of the check that was actually used to uh, buy Alaska. Uh, it's now held in NARA's holdings, and uh, NARA's collection. Um, it's important to note that when the transfer happened, it wasn't as simple as just signing a document. Alaska had a lot of people living there, and there needed to be documentation as to what was being bought. The land had to be surveyed, maps drawn, and the people that were living there went from being Russian citizens to US citizens. And so then in um, 1900, uh, Congress uh, officially mandates the creation of the Alaska State Museum and the Alaska State Library. Um, it wasn't until 1920 that the museum and the library get an official building of their own. Uh, this is Father Andrew P. Uh, Keshevarov, uh, Kesh Keshevarov, I always pronounce that wrong, um, the first dedicated curator and librarian. Uh, he was appointed by Governor Thomas Riggs and then led the institution from 1919 until his death in 1940. And then in 1906, the capital moves uh, from Sitka to Juneau. 1959, Alaska becomes a, officially becomes a state. Um, and then on the 100th anniversary of the transfer, uh, 50 years ago, Alaska, the Alaska State Museum that had up to this point had, had grown quite substantially, gets a new building. This is the new building 50 years ago. And uh, the library up to this point, which had been housed with the museum, now splits off. And the museum, um, the, the museum, of course, gets their own building. And then the library goes into the state office building a few blocks away. Um, and uh, otherwise, people in Juneau, Juneau call it the SOB. Uh, this is the old library space. It's actually, it was amazingly hard to find images of the old building. It's almost as if once the new building got built, they kind of purged all the old building memories from their thoughts. Um, but this is the old uh, library space up until a few years ago. So then in 1970, uh, the Alaska State Archives is officially established and it opens its doors officially in 1972. Um, this is the, uh, and it gets its own building a few blocks away and this is the old archive building. Then in 2009, uh, something, um, uh, here's a, the old, the stacks from the old archive building. Okay, so then in 2009, I don't know how many of you were there, uh, the WAC meeting happens. And um, this meeting will go down in WAC history as one of the most unique events we probably had, as it was the two days before the meeting, we had the Great Alaska State Archive flood. And um, so to make a long story short, uh, the contractors that were working on the roof of the building um, had set up a temporary cover that failed during a storm and resulted in severe flooding of the archive. And, my memory serves me right about, it was about several thousand file boxes were, were full of water and uh, some images from the flood. Um, this is the day before the WAC meeting. Um, and uh, um, yeah, not to embarrass some of our board members, here's Jennifer McGlinchey. Sorry, Jennifer. At, um, at this time, the, um, 
The uh, Alaska State Museum was also having problems. It was almost 50 years old by this point, and as Scott Carley likes to point out, it was as if, it was as, it was as if, if the building was falling apart around them. Uh, Ellen Carley sent me these photos, and uh, oh, here we go, um, and wanted me to actually point out, these are from the old building, that the, the um, it's hard to see, but uh, on the upper right image, uh, she actually has the, the ceiling leaks labeled. Um, and. Uh, and so, and, uh, and to embarrass one of our other board members, uh, there's Samantha Springer in the bottom left corner. So, um, so, uh, so anyway, this is the, uh, the old um, museum storage vault. Uh, the man on the left is the former curator of collections, Steve Enrickson, and the man on the right is the new chief curator, Addison Field. So after the archive flood, uh, that kind of, uh, that seemed to be the final straw, the, the library had grown well beyond its space and the museum and archive buildings were falling apart. So in 2013, the new, muse the new storage unit was finished uh, for the new museum and the entire collection was moved in. And then in 2014, the 1967, they're slammed the State, Arch State Library Archive and Museum, that's what they call it. Um, in 1967, the, uh, the 1967 building was officially torn down in 2014 to make way for the new building that was to house all three entities under one roof. So now three entities, the State Archive, Library, and Museum, which had their own buildings and are all put under one roof together. Here's a new building. Uh, the upper left image is the ribbon cutting and the image on the right is the governor of Alaska officially signing the bill, naming the building the Andrew P. Kesharov Building. And the one thing I want to quickly point out is the man in the middle on the right image uh, with the, uh, the mustache uh, standing in the background. Um, he's the chief, the former chief curator, Bob Banghart, uh, who retired last year, but m a lot of this project can actually be credited to him. Uh, this is one of the best wheelers and dealer curators and directors I've actually ever worked with. Um, I mean, he could wheel and deal like nobody I've ever seen. So some, um, Images from some of the new galleries at the museum. Now, keep in mind, this building is just open for, a, you know, just short of a year now. I think they're hitting their first season. So um, it's pretty magnificent. Um, and yes, there is a, a tree within the building. Um, so the new reading room for the, um, oh, some, some more galleries. Okay. The new reading room for the uh, library and archive, which is uh, pretty, pretty incredible. And then my, my personal favorite, um, the brand new storage vaults for the library and archive, which are, are really, really spectacular. On to the next part of my talk. Okay, so um, the new uh, Alaska State Museum Paper Lab. So you can see the lab, it's in its construction phase last year. I was brought up uh, at the beginning of last year to, um, to sort of sign off by the contractors on the lab. Uh, but at the time, it was uh, behind schedule and wasn't done yet. So we, the idea was is hopefully we're able to catch some of the, the issues at this point in the construction phase that, that, that would hopefully be addressed before I was scheduled to start working on the treaty documents earlier this year. And um, so I thought uh, in the spirit of lab designing uh, so far that it might actually be helpful to point out some of the things that we caught, the bigger problems that we caught uh, after at this sort of construction phase in case anybody here has to design a paper lab. Again, you don't go through the same problems. And I call this the growing pains of a new paper lab. So the first problem we picked up on, which um, was, uh, was the, the lab designers decided, and with the best of intentions, even though we, we, um, it was, we were told them that, uh, so water, of course, is a, a main component of a paper lab, and we had told them what we wanted, but the lab designers decided with the best of intentions to go a step beyond what we had asked for and install a, about a $10,000 millipore DI water system into the chem room between the paper lab and the object lab. And uh, this is, of course, a great system, but it has a max daily output of about four or five gallons per day. And, um, and it's in a different room from the paper lab, and uh, Ellen, Ellen would repeatedly say she asked for a cat and got a cheetah. And, um, and so this was not gonna work and this had, uh, they'd already bought it so we couldn't return it. And so the lab, co the, lab uh, the contractor in charge came up with a kind of a really lucky and brilliant solution. 
And they discovered that the HVAC, um, the RO water system, the reverse osmosis water system for the HVAC was actually right above the paper lab. And so they just routed a water line straight down and it just happened to land right next to the paper lab sink. And so we got kind of lucky and you can see it there on the left. Um, and uh, it was an easy fix. We, we liked easy fixes. Um, the, uh, so the next issue that came up was the imaging issue. And keeping in mind, this is a brand new paper lab. They're, they have no idea how to do imaging. This has never come up before. And so the lab designers put in a, a really beautiful copy stand uh, in the corridor between the two labs. But it quickly became apparent that, that when we were looking at the pieces considered for the exhibit, that many of the items that were wanting to be treated were actually too big for the copy stand. Uh, one of which is, is an eight foot map that I'm gonna talk about a little later. So to get around this, thankfully I had some warning on this one, I, I dragged up a traveling lighting system that I, 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 go, that I use and uh, we set up a temporary studio in the paper lab for photographing the pieces. Um, the next issue, which, which proved to be the most challenging, was when the lab was being designed, the space called for a, a full four by six foot suction table from Museum Services Corp. And the space on the left uh, was where the table was supposed to be. Uh, the problem became quickly apparent, uh, even though Ellen had warned the, the contractors about this for years beforehand, they had actually forgotten to install any kind of outtake vent for the suction table vacuum exhaust hose. So we had no way of um, venting anything. And so this is a, a, a pretty serious problem if you wanna use any solvents. So without an exhaust port you of course, that vents out of the lab, of course you can't, um, you can't send anything through the table, it just ends up back in the lab again. And you can't stick it in a fume hood in this case because the fume hood's in a different room and you can't stick it outside because at the time half a year outside it looks like this. So we really had a hard time with this one and they ended up um, buying a 30 foot long hose and running it up through the ceiling and across a few rooms and down in the fume hood next door. And so uh, you can see, sort of see the hose on the right, but this took a, about a week or so to two weeks. Of course, ordering anything in Alaska takes a week to get up there. So this put a small delay on the project. And then finally, the, the big one, which, which uh, was tricky, was supplies. Um, we had a pretty limited budget for this. Uh, we had the skeleton of a lab, and we had the major equipment and nothing else. Um, and uh, we had no chemistry, no brushes, no glassware, trays, nothing. We had a dozen, you know, dozens of cabinets and drawers, and they were all empty. So we had to basically stock a lab for nothing, and we had to pick and choose, but we got it done. So finally, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about some of the pieces that were part of the project. Um, so this is the team that uh, compromised the project from the museum, the library, and the archive. Um, and uh, so here we are going over all the pieces for the exhibit. Um, it's important to keep in mind that we had no single curator coordinating all of this. Uh, all the way on the right is Ellen Carley, uh, it's hard to see, and then we have Zach Jones, the state archivist, uh, Jackie Manning from the exhibits department, and Jim Samarn and Sorrel Goodman from the State Library. And um, the exhibit was to be uh, comprised of uh, pieces from the State Archive Collection and the State Library Collection, keeping in mind that neither collection knew what the other was bringing. And uh, this was the first time all three collecting entities from the state had actually ever worked together on a single project. So the preliminary design for the exhibit and the space, uh, so this is a preliminary drawing of a design of what the exhibit was supposed to look like. And uh, part of the exhibit was to also to sell the public on the potential of a paper lab so that more projects like this could happen. And so this was meant to tell the story also of how some of these pieces were treated. So the overall premise of the exhibit was to revolve around two centerpieces. And um, on the left is an eight foot map of New Archangel or Sitka. It's a hand drawn eight foot map drawn in 1867, the year of the transfer, and on the right is a painting of the signing of the Alaska Treaty showing Secretary of State Seward at his desk discussing the purchase of the territory painted, and this painting is done by Emmanuel, uh, you have to pardon this, uh, Lutz, I believe Lutz. is, what's that? Lutz, Lutz thank you. Um, this painting was believed to have been uh, lost or destroyed, and uh, when in 1930 it was discovered to be in the possession of the Seward family, it had never been exhibited in Alaska before, so the painting will actually be uh, coming, up to the coming up from the Seward House in New York and going on tour through Alaska, um, thanks to uh, American Airlines and FedEx, who sponsored that. 
And all of the pieces in the exhibit were somehow or another directly tied to either the painting or the map. And so just a quick preview of some of the pieces, and then I'm gonna go into detail on some of the other ones. Most of these were pretty minor treatment stuff, just small nicks and tears, things like that. So we have um, on uh, the upper left, uh, a newspaper article from the time. Uh, on the right, um, a copy of the speech of the president's speech, and on the bottom, one of the maps from the, from the uh, the surveying maps. So um, um, this is the original. Pro oh, there we go. This is the original proclamation sent by Secretary of State Seward on behalf of President John Johnson to the citizens of New Archangel. Okay, the uh, orders to the U.S. military oh, headquarters in New Archangel. So um, I want to talk briefly about the treatment of that Sitka map. Um, and I, I pardon my stitched image here. Uh, I had to shoot it in two sections. So the map measures uh, four by eight feet. Uh, contrary to what it might look like, it's actually not drawn on paper, but highly sized fabric. Uh, the media is primarily watercolor and iron gold ink. Uh, it's a closer view. Um, what I want you to observe in this is the massive quantity of cellophane tape on this map. Um, it actually runs along this entire edge on both sides. Um, it's also throughout the rest of the map as well. Uh, all in all, I measured about nine feet of cumulative tape on this thing. Um, the treatment of the map actually was pretty straightforward. Uh, because it was sized fabric, it couldn't be washed. So the treatment called for the removal of all the tape, uh, followed by lining it on the suction table in sections. Uh, because the map was too big for the suction table, we were able to get around this by um, taking the dome off of the suction table and just putting the table between the labs to other tables, so we had a really nice uh, working distance. Um, the carrier came off uh, pretty easily uh, with the use of um, acetone chambers uh, and inverted petri dishes. Uh, I um, was asked by the exhibit staff to save all the carrier for, so they could actually put it on the exhibit with the map. So you can see on the right, that's all the tape that I pulled off of this, this map. Um, once all the carrier came off, uh, the, um, I had to remove all the adhesive, which turned, to, uh, turned out to be soluble in xylene. At this point, they had fixed the ventilation issue for the suction table, so that was primarily done on the suction table. Uh, here's the whole map after, as I'm pulling the adhesive off. And then uh, finally, um, um, here I am toning an inlay um, in the upper right corner for the section that was missing. After, uh, here's the map after it was lined. Um, one of the discussions that was had was how to um, store this map after it came off of the exhibit. So it needed to be framed in a method that allowed for it to be easily dismantled once the exhibit came down. Okay. Um, so, uh, so what we did is we stitched it all the way around to a large piece of chloroplast. Um, and then that's how it was framed. And then once the exhibit comes down, they're just going to unstitch it and then roll it up. So, and then it'll go into storage roll. Okay, and so here it is, uh, part of the bad lighting, this is in their vault. Um, but this is, it's being, this is after it's framed before it goes on the exhibit. So the next piece I'm gonna show um, is, uh, is the, the land deed, is this land deed. This actually, this was important for the exhibit as it tied directly to a plot of land shown in the Sitka map. And the problem for this was that um, it was sewn, uh, sealed, it had paper, it, it had a whole bunch of stuff all over it. So we couldn't wash it. And um, no one really liked the idea of taking it apart. And um, the iron gold ink wasn't really showing any corrosion. So we decided to just uh, um, address the physical damage, uh, the tears, the creases, the losses, things like that. Here's the other side. Okay, so flattening out the creases. I bought a, found a blender. Luckily, there's a Salvation Army right across the street from the museum. So I, I bought him a blender. That was my contribution to the lab. Um, all the losses were pulp filled, and uh, here we go. This new suction table pulp filling. Okay, pulp filling. More pulp filling. Sorry, pulp filled images. Okay, and um, here it is now. That's the front and back. All right, so uh, I'm gonna do one final image of a treatment. And um, so we, this one didn't make the cut for the exhibit, but we had some extra time at the end, and the library had um, considered this a high priority piece. Uh, this was a smaller version of the large map, um, and uh, they didn't feel the need to have two copies of the map on display. And uh, this one, um, they wanted me to address the tide lines on the right-hand side and line it, because they were really happy with the way the lining turned out on the big one. So 
Um, so the tide lines were pulled out um, on the suction table. Uh, it also had some old masking tape on it too along the edge. So um, we were able to get this off just by using heat and saturated blotter on, um, on the sub, well it's my small platen, but on the suction table platen. And, um, let's see, and we were able to get most of the tide lines out and so here it is lined without the tide lines. So um, same cartographer as that big map, just uh, this one didn't make the cut. So, um, and um, so I thought I'd conclude here with um, the exhibit. Uh, this is as of Friday and it's opening next week. So this is all of the pieces for the exhibit on display in the paper lab. We had the Lieutenant Governor coming through and so he wanted to see everything before I left. So, and this is the exhibit getting installed last Friday, courtesy of Ellen sending me some images of the installation. The conservation exhibit, thankfully, you know, this is what happens when you don't have a paper conservator on staff, you can commandeer their, all their tools. So the, um, uh, hopefully this, uh, that's the big map on display as they're uh, prepping. And uh, so finally, I just wanna uh, thank, uh, these are all the amazing people that helped me on this. Um, and uh, um, and I, I really wanna thank Ellen Carley for this because she wrote, she wrote the grant to bring me up. Um, and uh, just a, a quick point out, the, on, uh, Jackie Manning is actually installing this last week at eight and a half months pregnant. I'm amazed. She, uh, she is, um, she's a machine. I don't know how she does that. So that being said, um, so I uh, want to thank uh, WAC and the, um, the funders for this, which is the Alaska Historical Commission, the Alaska State Museum. And I apologize for my slide skipping like crazy. And that's it. So thank you. Was I way over? Um, that was fun to see the changes that have been happening in Alaska because you could see I was cutting my teeth there years ago. Um, does anybody have any questions for Seth? Yes, Susie. Seth, where did you line the large map? And I'll, ju I'll just repeat the question sure. so that we have it for the sure. video. Um, Susie was asking what the um, map was lined with. Uh, yeah, it was lined onto, um, onto Japanese tissue. Uh, we used um, the... Um, the, we didn't use handmade tissue. We used the machine Japanese tissue for that uh, just because it was, well, one, more economical, and two, we can get it in larger sections. So it was lined onto three strips of large Japanese tissue. Yeah. Wheat starch based. So, right, it was lined face down dry on the suction table in three sections. So. So do you have one more question? I had the same oh, question. Yeah, but, yeah. 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 I had the same question. Yeah. It's on. But, it's on. Um, it's on? Okay. Yeah. But now I'm wondering, what fabric was the map made of? We, we, um, you know, uh, we wanted to, um, there, there was some interest in testing that. Ellen offered to do some fiber analysis. Um, I personally believe it was either linen or cotton. I, I don't really know for sure. But um, the, uh, at, at the time when we were thinking about doing fiber analysis, it was just, we were under such time constraints and Ellen was so swamped doing other things that we just never got to that. Um, I believe it was probably linen or cotton, so, yeah. Yeah. Um, I have a question as well sure. about that sure. fabric. You said it was highly sized. It was really shiny. Really shiny? Super shiny. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know if maybe it was architectural linen? I, I don't know. I mean, it's, it, it was, we, we had little to no time to do any analytical okay. analysis on it, um, and we were, we, I mean, it took me a week just to get all the tape off that thing. So, mm -hmm. and that the lining was a two person deal and I didn't have any help. So I had to kind of rely around Ellen's schedule to give me an extra set of hands. So we just didn't have the time to do any more analytical testing on it. But um, it was, it was mirror shiny. It was a really shiny map. So, Thanks. yeah. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Thanks Seth. Thanks, Sam.